uh, you had a slide there that said sustainability uh, may require greater consumption of resources, not less. Um, if the definition of sustainability is that we want to remain on this planet healthy, um, I didn't get that. If your uh, definition of sustainability is that uh, we want to go on consuming um, and keeping the lifestyle we have, it makes sense. But your, your answer to this gentleman was that you get that, uh, you know, I think what the people in this room understand. So um, I guess where I'm confused is that it seems to me that you're educating um, that you have the opportunity to educate, and so uh, why tell people consuming that, that sustainability is going to require consuming more? Did that make sense? Yes, and, okay, and the you. reason is because sustainability is a function of solving problems, and it takes resources to solve problems. Uh, the, the example that we gave in the Roman Empire was that they needed more and more resources to be sustainable and, and undercut their production system in doing that but they did achieve two centuries of sustainability, which is nothing to laugh at. Um, in the future, the problem may be uh, a lack of resources on our planet, or too much pollution on our planet, or change in climate on our planet, but we're not gonna solve those problems by being poor. Um, and, unless people drastically change the, the material quality of life that they're willing to accept. See, I, I, approach, I approach sustainability from the assumption that most people will choose to sustain what they are familiar with, which is their accustomed way of life. So then the question becomes, how do you sustain that in the face of problems? And the answer is, it takes more and more resources to do so. I don't say I necessarily approve of that or advocate that, I just see that as a historical reality. I'd say that that's impossible. Oh, in the long run, it is impossible, yes. I, I don't know if we're at that point yet, but in the long run, yes. Had it right that it might be the dark ages, but they survived where the Roman Empire, even though it continued for a couple more centuries, didn't. So I guess I'm, I'm an advocate of cutting back. That's not okay. okay. That's fine. It appears that you're saying that all societies must inevitably collapse. And I'd like to contrast that with Jared Diamond's statement. How the subtitle, I think, of his book on collapse is titled something like how societies choose to succeed or choose to fail. It doesn't look like we have any real choice. No, and that's one of the problems I have with that subtitle of his book, is that societies don't choose, they're confronted with circumstances. Um, do all societies have to collapse? I, I don't want to predict that that's inevitable, although I will say that over the last two or three years, I have become more pessimistic on that point. Uh, doc, uh, Dr. Tainer, uh, one of the issues here at this conference are, um, is money. I know they're going to be focusing a lot on deflation. And my question is, could we slow the collapse of our civilization mm -hmm. if we change the way money works? We have a hierarchical-based, debt-based money system where money is borrowed into existence as opposed to being issued into existence as Abraham Lincoln's greenbacks were. Inevitably, 40% of the cost in any product or service are interest costs, because even when you're buying something, that company that produced it is in debt to somebody. Mm -hmm. So we have to have economic growth to pay the, uh, the growing interest costs, which are going up exponentially, not only in the government sector, but much more significantly in the private sector, which far exceeds government debt, is private mm -hmm. debt. So have you looked into how different societies may have organized their monetary system, and if that could play a role in at least slowing collapse, if not making a, a steady state existence possible. Well, in, in a sense, by debasing the currency, the Romans were postponing collapse. Um, they were, but, but that amounts to shifting the costs to the future. But, but ancient, ancient societies, ancient governments, rarely were able to borrow. Um, they operated on a cash basis, on the basis of precious metals that they had on hand, and that's how they paid their bills. Um, our, our system today of finance is so different, uh, and of course, as you point out, the, the entire economic system runs on, on debt, it runs on finance. Um, I'm not an economist, I, I don't know if there's what would be involved in, 
in, in coming down off of that, really that's a question I don't think I could answer. Perhaps others here can. Uh, I, uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned that the humans do not think broadly. Mm -hmm. Here in Grand Rapids, we have a, um, a new thing in education called Big History, and it's being pushed by Bill Gates. Uh, he wants to help the poor. And in order to do that, you have to know history going all the way back to the Big Bang. And you take your little area here and understand its history, but then you've got to put it into the next ring up and in, in the, the next ring up. And it kind of goes back to a movie that was shown back in the 1960s called The Powers of Ten, where we started uh, on the, uh, the surface of a park in Chicago and went all the way to the edge of the, of the, the galaxy. And then uh, we went all the way down into, uh, we'll say, string theory. And if you know all that history, then perhaps you can really understand this world and solve problems. What's your reaction to something like that? That sounds like a great program. It's certainly what I would advocate. Um, hum humans, by inclination, do not think broadly. But I am a little optimistic that if we taught children at an early age, perhaps they could, some of them at least, could learn to. Could learn to be curious about things that are distant in time or distant in space and to see connections between those distant things and, and our lives today. Uh, I, I sometimes think that if I was 30 years younger and just starting my career, I might spend more time talking to K-12 educators, um, talking to them about how, how can you teach children to, to be curious about things that are distant in time and space. I mean, ch children come out of schools today with no interest in history or geography. You know, they're, they're subjects that most of them hate having to take. Um, are, are there ways to teach those so that they're more interesting or so that students can see the importance of knowing these things to see how history, how the past influences our lives today and will influence the future? Um, if, there's, if someone's trying to program here along those lines, I think that's wonderful. We have, we have time for one last question. Okay. Hi, my name is Max Lockwood. Um, I'm wondering, um, given that this society's collapse seems to be inevitable and that its effects are more global than any other society previously and it's um, the damaging effects of collapse could be you know very long-term and serious for the entire planet um, environmentally socially you name it um, what I'm wondering is will would an active acceleration of the collapse do you think that would cause more net negative effects than if we just allow the society to kind of collapse on its own and its own process. Well, co co collapse, collapse in my conception is, is rapid, but, but as a historian, what I mean by rapid is over several decades. Right. Um, regardless whether it's over several decades or whether it's sooner, the net effect is going to be that tens of millions, perhaps hundreds of millions of people will starve to death or die of disease. It's going to be unpleasant either way. It's not a future we want. Right, so I guess what I, was, what I was asking is, is it, in your opinion, um, would the overall effects be, basically is it better if it happens sooner than later, more drawn out? Quick pain versus long-term pain? Sort of, yeah. <laughs> for for I, the... Uh, I'd have to flip a coin on that one, right I'm on. sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, if we could thank Dr. Tainter for his time.